Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Betty Y. of Chicago. that I have 15 minutes, so uh, needless to say, you're not going to receive a blow-by-blow blow from me. Uh, I spoke at the um, banquet of the Young People's Convention when it was in Philadelphia in 1960, and at that time, uh, I had five years sobriety. I was 29 years old when I was first taken to AA in New York City back in July of 1956. So uh, it would appear that this, as I'm 39 now, will be just about the last one where I will be able to qualify in AA. I um, uh, have indeed enjoyed this convention. I've received a great deal out of it. Uh, probably one of the most important things that, that uh, we receive from gathering together is that as we do 12-step work, I know I am inclined <clears throat> to, as we look at our before people, our candidates to AA, to prejudge and say, oh my, my, I don't think so. And uh, when we come to these conventions and we see the afters, all of us really should go back to our groups and back to 12-step work, realizing, as uh, it is said in AA, that indeed nobody is hopeless and that recovery is possible regardless of age, regardless of race, regardless of mental illness, etc., that if the, a person has an alcoholic problem, that indeed AA can work. One thing that I have noticed in, uh, here among the talks, which I think is, is salient, uh, it is to me because of my own age when I came into AA, is that there are two classes of alcoholics, young, young people who are alcoholics, some of whom arrive in AA and some of whom don't. The first class, of course, is the young person who was in the early stages of alcoholism. And the second uh, class of people uh, who are alcoholic are people who are full-blown alcoholics and also happen to be young people. So that uh, the older members of AA who came when they were in their 40s are people who, when they were young, were in this first class. They were people who were in, uh, in their 20s and perhaps early 30s in the early stages of alcoholism. Otherwise, they would not have survived long enough to arrive here or anywhere else by the time they had reached 40 or 50. There is, as we know and have seen and have heard speak at this convention, many, many full-blown alcoholics who were in their late teens, early 20s, and so on. And with people like this, time has run out. It has run out as much, certainly, as anyone who hits bottom and arrives at a later age. Therefore, as it has been stated here by so many young people who, when they first arrived in AA, felt that uh, some of the older members had spilt more on their ties than they had drunk, better be awfully sure which class they are in. The young lady, another young lady that came with us yesterday who celebrated her first anniversary, some of you I'm sure heard her speak, is 26 years old and she had already had five hospitalizations. Now this is hardly someone in the early stages of alcoholism. Why this is important and was important to me is to know which category we fit into is because of this uh, almost prime requisite of AA for membership is what we term a bottom. And I'm sure most of you, as I have had people say to me uh, who were young, who have trouble, relapses and slips, does this mean that I have to go all the way down, that I have to lose jobs and lose husbands and um, go this whole route before I will be ready for AA? What is a bottom? Now, in the case of the second class of people, those who are full-blown alcoholics and, and just happen to still be in their 20s, uh, this does not apply because uh, uh, the bottom is already prepared for them. Uh, Mother Nature, through the disease of alcoholism, is what provides our bottom. 
But today we hear so much publicity, and indeed it is true, that with the knowledge that we have of this illness, plus Alcoholics Anonymous, that this should not be necessary, that people have to spend the best years of their lives suffering from this disease and perhaps not surviving it before they are ready to do what this program calls for. Um, another thing that I think that is uh, salient in the difference between uh, coming to AA when one is young and when one hits, uh, shall we say, 40, is that indeed the experience in, of recovery in AA is, is, is quite different. Uh, for those who are young, I think, uh, or rather for those who are older, uh, the emphasis in the AA way of life is probably put on the first part of the serenity prayer of uh, asking for the serenity to accept what can't be changed, which is a past life. And with uh, those of us that were younger, probably the emphasis is put a little bit more on asking for the courage to change the things that we can. Um, my recovery in AA of the past 10 years has uh, not been um, quiet and peaceful at all. Uh, I won't, <laughs> if I had time, I would go into some of it because... Uh, the one thing, and God knows I owe this to this program, that I can say about the past 10 years is that I have been sober. And indeed, I owe that to Alcoholics Anonymous because for at least four or five years before I came to AA, I had tried to do this on my own. I certainly knew I couldn't drink, and uh, it just simply did not work. The uh, bottom thing for me, and it is something that I have tried to, uh, to uh, stress with with younger people, because uh, uh, another point that, uh, among these, these people that are full-blown alcoholics in, in their 20s is this, that uh, people in the third and last stages of alcoholism just simply do not survive long enough to reach, uh, reach this program when they are ready. I have, can think in the past two or three years of at least four or five people who had not even reached 30 who are dead and were dead of chronic <coughs> alcoholism. And uh, so obviously those who get here in their 40s and 50s, are it's the survival of the fittest. They are the people who, for some reason or other, had a stronger constitution and uh, were able to survive the war, so to speak, uh, to get here. So there is no such thing, I don't think, of this bottom being a chronological or an age uh, bracket. As we know, a bottom does not mean either that because a person has years of... Um, ghastly experience, that this in itself is going to induce a bottom. I believe it is a terribly important thing, at least for me, to realize why it is said that a bottom is so essential and actually what a bottom is. And I can only tell you of myself, and uh, this is what I'm going to pass on to you in the few minutes that I have. Through my drinking and through the things that I survived, in my drinking, I acquired an attitude somewhere along the line that I was indestructible. Uh, I believed this uh, while I was drinking. I certainly knew I was suffering, but I could never even thought, nor could I conceive of the fact that alcohol or anything else was going to kill me. Uh, I certainly should have had some kind of a better awareness of this than I did because it killed my father at the age of 38 years old. And... Uh, this was just about when AA first came into existence. But like all of us, we do indeed have a, a sober insanity. And uh, I had somewhere planned in the back of my mind that I was uh, indestructible. I learned sober through this program, and I believe this was the grace of God, because it was at this time that I really began to have a turning point in my recovery, and I began to appreciate sobriety, uh, and I began to appreciate just living. When I was drinking, I did not appreciate living. Uh, in a sense, I felt it was a curse. When I came into AA in 56 feeling indestructible, all I could see stretching ahead of me were all these years of going one day at a time, not being able to drink. Not, uh, drinking was about my only outlet, and uh, I was doomed to this. These, I am quite sure, are feelings of self-destruction. But I learned through the spiritual growth that AA offers that my life, as everybody else's life, has a beginning, and indeed it has an end. And this 24-hour program that we live by began to mean something more to me than merely a gimmick of getting through the day. 
I began to realize that nobody, regardless of what age we are, knows just how many 24 hours we have ahead of us. And in this time that is allotted to us, we have through the program of AA a choice of how we're going to spend those 24 hours. Um, before this, as I say, I've pictured and figured 40, 50 years of one day at a time trying to stay away from that first drink. But when I began to realize in a spiritual sense almost the meaning of time and the meaning of, of uh, how I was to use this gift of life in the time allotted to me was for me, in a sense, a sober bottom. I had to first of all come to believe and uh, to certainly acquire some kind of closer uh, conscious contact with God as I understood him before um, I was able to emotionally accept this fact that I did not know how much time I had ahead of me. And as this began to set into my heart and my mind, the gift of life and the gift of today, regardless of the pains and problems that we must all face, began to mean something to me. And indeed, since that turning point in my life, it has become almost inconceivable of me uh, for me to wish to, to waste any of this precious time, uh, to waste it in being ob uh, oblivious, drunk, to waste it in the false values, the things that meant so much to me when I was drinking. All of my values changed with an awareness that indeed, as it is said, in all reality, that all we have is today. None of us know, regardless of age, regardless of how long we've been sober, and regardless of whether we have slips in the future or don't have slips, drink or stay sober, none of us know how much time we have. And indeed, when we look at it, at least when I look at it that way, uh, the steps, the spiritual growth, the gift of AA, the gift of the tools that we have been given, uh, began to really take on the value that I'm sure that they are supposed to take. This, for me, was a bottom. And you see, when a person realizes, actually, what a, what a bottom is in AA, I believe, is when a person realizes that if he drinks, it, he is going to die. It's going to kill him. And he receives an emotional awareness of this fact. All of a sudden, life begins to take on a new meaning. It's pretty much, I should say, the same thing as there are no atheists in a foxhole. I'm sure any man going off to war probably has a bottom in this sense. And uh, it is this type of thing that I believe if a young person who is in the early stages of alcoholism can understand and become aware of that indeed there is no reason to waste this valuable time in experimenting and drinking and, quote, living, unquote, there are, of course, many things that I could, uh, I'd keep here all afternoon, you can miss all your trains, and uh, we'd uh, join that food convention in the next room, but I'm afraid the management would get a resentment if I did that. And uh, so I, I'm going to touch on one other point and then close, and that is something else that came up in this convention, and I think is, is discussed more and more in AA as a whole, is why anonymity? Uh, the importance of anonymity. Is it important or isn't it? And is it blocking uh, our fellowship from carrying the message? And again, I think that I began to realize, <laughs> too, at least for myself, through the spiritual growth that AA offers, that anonymity, as it is stated in this program, is an integral part of my recovery. In other words, were this not an anonymous program, in the sense that there are no big wheels, uh, in the sense that we do not uh, wear medals stating I am sober, um, has been for me a, a terribly important tool to practice. And in the practice of the anonymity, I have been able to maintain my sobriety. So I am of the opinion, and that's all we have as our own experience and our own opinions, is that if anonymity were removed in this program of AA, that we would remove an awful lot of recoveries, because it is, for some of us anyway, and probably for most of us, a tool of recovery in a spiritual sense. As most of you have, I have at conventions, banquets, and meetings heard many, many poems, prayers, uh, 
speeches, everything practically from the Gettysburg Address to the 21st Psalm quoted by AA speakers. And the other night before I was coming down here, a thought occurred to me, something that is almost as well known as the national anthem that all of us know and hear all the time is a four-line verse from a hymn, it's probably the best-known hymn in America, that indeed expresses for me what I have received from AA and indeed what I believe all of us have received from AA. And so I'm going to end this by giving you some very familiar words without comment, and perhaps some of you or all of you will see what I have seen in this with regard to the program of AA and my own recovery. Through AA, I have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Uh, I have seen him trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath were stored. I have seen him loose his fearful lightning in his terrible swift sword. Through AA, I have seen his truth go marching on. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Betty. Uh, you lived up to your advanced billing, by the way. You know, uh, as I heard Betty speak, uh, a lot of things flashed through my mind. Odd as it might seem to many of you out here in this audience today, uh, when Betty spoke of the young people that are coming into AA now being the oldsters of tomorrow, uh, she hit home. Because when I first became associated with AA, I could very easily, for many years thereafter, have attended this conference. And I see many of my contemporaries in this audience today that are sitting here that have about the same time in this program that I have. All those people were well under 40 when they came on this program. So Betty spoke a mouthful. And incidentally, uh, you took the 21st Psalm away from me. I was going to quote it, so I won't do that now. Uh, the next speaker on this program uh, is billed from England and then the United States. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Pat F., also of Chicago. My name is Pat. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I came to AA when I was um, 29 years old. Uh, Betty was speaking of bottoms. I physically could have gone much further, but I think uh, spiritually and mentally I was as low as I could go and had been for some time. Uh, mentally as low as I felt that at any moment I was going to go insane, that there was no life ahead of me but to drink and slowly get worse. Uh, the day I called, I think, was the first day that I really looked at myself, looked at the bottle and identified myself as having a drinking problem. I knew nothing about alcoholism. I knew nothing about the program of recovery. Before, I just wanted to drink. I would not wanted to... Um, in any way control it. It was the only medicine I knew which could get me through a day, which could get me going through the motions of living. But that last day before calling AA, I reached a, an all-time low, and I thank God now that um, I just could see what bottom could be in many years ahead of me if I continued to drink. Just a gray nothing, an insanity, and really nothing worth living for. So I called and went to AA, and um, I was looking for every excuse there was to prove myself not an alcoholic. I could see, I learned something about the disease of alcoholism, it being the three parts, spiritual, mental, and physical. Uh, this I learned about. Um, I could believe that if I continued to drink, I too would end up in an institution. Uh, I might commit suicide. Anything bad could happen. But I felt as a young person that, um, all right, I had a drinking problem, and AA could take care of that, but what about all these other problems I had? What about the inability to communicate with people, the inability to live even a few minutes at peace with myself, uh, 
just an inability to live. It didn't really get through to me for many, many months sober that this was all part of the disease of alcoholism, that I was feeling as I was because I had grown slowly into a need to escape, and found it through the bottle. Now the medicine was removed, and I still had all these many needs to escape, and it was going to be a long time before I slowly recovered and found many reasons to stay sober. I didn't know this in the beginning. I was just hurting. So the bottle was taken away, and I said, all right, I won't drink, and I didn't. And it didn't seem that important to me because, I say, I came in with a job. I could pay the rent. And um, really, nothing seemed to change at all. I didn't change for many, many months. I just didn't change. I just wasn't drinking, and that's all there was to it. And I think, as far as bottom goes, I think I hit quite a number of bottoms sober. Uh, not too long ago, maybe four or five months ago, as soon as that, I, I went through a period where it had built up so much that I had thoughts of suicide, and this was after more than a year sober. But it increasingly became apparent to me that if I don't drink, all this will go away. This will all get better. And that it doesn't prove that I am unique in that I can't be helped by the program. It doesn't mean that I am uniquely a different type of alcoholic. Um, it doesn't mean that these steps won't work for me. It merely means or came to mean for me that I am completely an alcoholic in my, in my thoughts, in my living, in the way it has been, the way it is, and the way it will be. I am completely an alcoholic. And that by living these steps, slowly it will all sort out. But as I was say, as a young person, I think sometimes it is difficult. We say a high bottom. I, I could look at the fact that I was still working. I didn't like to admit it was the help of many pills that kept me going through the hangovers and got me going to work. That um, it was the drinking and many, many things that kept me going. I just um, know that as a young person, you look back and you feel, well, I wasn't hospitalized, I didn't go to jail. So, um, really just utter confusion. But now, I, apart from the spark of hope which I had the day I called, just a small spark, I knew that there was a better way of life, that it needn't be like this. This has grown slowly, and now I find that... Um, it really isn't as complicated as I thought it was. I'm not so uniquely different as I thought I was. <laughs> I want to live, and I want to be a whole person. I'm tired of being sick. I'm tired of being dependent upon an outside force, something artificial to keep me going. I want to be myself, and I want to grow. I also thought I complained bitterly that through my life with my family, and that was a mess, my life in England, my coming over here, moving around from friend to friend, from place to place, always feeling different. I felt that I had no guidelines. This was my one big complaint. I've got no guidelines to, be li to live by. I don't know what's right. I don't know what's wrong for me or for anybody else. I just don't know how to live. And I used this as an excuse for a long time. I'm too confused to understand what you're talking about. But this excuse, too, is gone. It's what's slowly happening. Each excuse, each bolt hole is taken away. And I become an alcoholic recovering in AA, just as simply as that. Where else could there be better tools for living than in the 12 steps? I balked at every one of them. I, I wanted to take the first one I took, but I really didn't want to go any further. I didn't want to try it. I didn't want to get myself out of conflicts of doing as it had always been all my life, do what I want to do now regardless of the consequences. Don't think, just go ahead and do what you want to do. It didn't, I really just didn't want to change at all. I talked about wanting to change. I talked about the need to change. I talked about, um, yes, I must get active. I must help the new person. I go to this meeting, that meeting, go to the hospitals, get busy, get busy, run, run, run. But I really was doing nothing for a long time. But increasingly, as I see, it's just staying away. It really is as simple as that for me now, staying away from the drink at a day at a time. And the other things that it now becomes necessary for me to do become clear through not drinking. Just by not drinking, it, it, it really is laid out simply 1 to 12. When I was first asked to come down to speak at St. Louis, I said yes. And then as about two weeks before um, it was due to take place, I was looking for a good excuse to say I can't come, and the main one was that 
I'm going through a very quiet period. I don't seem to have much to say. I don't have many answers. Um, I spoke quite a bit for a long time, up to about three months ago. I was talking quite a bit, and I seemed to have a lot to say. Now I realize this was just a long list of complaints of how difficult it was to stay sober. <laughs> now I don't have this long list of complaints. I can just tell you that I'm happy, I'm sober, um, I'm growing, and I'm glad to be here. And really, that's as far as it goes. I, I just am getting the answers for myself, but I haven't yet reached a point where I can say, well, if this way, that way, and if you do this and that, then you will feel such and such. I'm still learning slowly, and I was, it took me nine months sober to become an alcoholic. It really did. I mouthed it, you know. I said, from the day I got there, I said, yeah, yeah, I'm an alcoholic. You know, I, I needed to be somewhere. I needed help. I couldn't live on my own. And if this is what you had to say, then I'd con them into believing I was an alcoholic. But, uh, so I'm a slow starter. It took all that time to become one. It took a lot longer time to um, feel less unique. So it's just a slow, slow, growing better and getting a bit older on AA. So there isn't really very much to say except that I'm very happy to be here. And I know now that I am one of you. And this, to me, means a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Uh, as uh, she was talking, uh, I, I, I see a kindred soul here. Pat, from her account, uh, came to the United States to become an alcoholic. I went to England and became an alcoholic. <laughs> There's something else that strikes me, and incidentally, Pat, that was splendid. Thank you so much. There's something else that strikes me. Uh, when I came on this program... It was rare indeed that you ever heard a woman speak. And I was used to uh, mostly the old Helen Brimstone uh, Alcoholics Anonymous people that waved their arms and gave terrific talks, inspiring talks. And the emergence of the women, the woman member of AA, as speakers in the last, I'd say, eight or nine years has been a tremendous thing. Today, I believe that should I have to call upon 20 speakers, that I could finally, probably find 20 more competent speakers among women in the city of St. Louis today than I could among men. I mean better. So thank you both, you ladies, for being here and helping me. Now we have another pinch hitter. Incidentally, Pat was not a pinch hitter. We have another pinch hitter. This gentleman, I know nothing about his background except he comes highly recommended as speaker. And it's a great pleasure for me to give you, from Southern California, Richard T. Thank you, Barney. I'm Richard, and I am an alcoholic. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> You're coming through loud and clear. It is beautiful, believe me. I also have a problem with drugs, which I won't mention much. However, I do have a problem with drugs, heroin, opium, marijuana, and pills. And with uh, God, through you people, it wasn't necessary for me to take not even an aspirin, mind you, for over six years. And cigarette for over four years. Now, talking about following instructions, 15 minutes of talk, I feel like that little boy that stuttered a lot, joined the infantry, and then got courageous and joined the airborns, and came time for him to jump off the airplane, you know, or rather before entering the air airplane to jump, he asked the sergeant, he said, Sarge, uh, how, 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 how long you say we, we, we got to c c c count before pulling the string? He says, for you, Sonny, one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And so you get up all that shit. And I imagine the sergeant got all altruistic suddenly and gave him this to a radio and told him, I will instruct you when you're ready to jump. Fear not, son. Fear not. And here he was. Door was open. Uh, you the sergeant? He says, yeah. Go ahead. So the boy, very confident-like, took a dive and uh, pulled the string after the one, one count. Nothing happened. And all the way down, I mean, he's trying everything he's got. And Sarge, uh, sergeant, are you there? What happened? I pulled the string. What do I do now? And the sergeant says, repeat after me, our father. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful that we have a sense of humor? Very good thing, believe me. A very good thing. I am an alcoholic, the kind that was chronic. There is the leopard that will never change its spots. I've heard this yesterday. I came to the program, I was 28 years old and completely gone. Uh, I don't know how I would tell you about my background, really. I might stumble into it here and there. But if I was to put my drinking career and my drug addiction career into a capsule, I would put it in this way. The drug and alcohol being the power, I was led deep into hell through the doors of heaven. Very deep into hell through the doors of heaven with booze and drugs. And so a day came when I woke up from an endless fall into a, a pit. And I mean an endless dark fall. You know, I used to love falling backwards. I really did. It was quite a kick. Because you go down and you have this beautiful sensation, an elation beyond description, only an alcoholic knows, you know. And then when you're on the ground, you feel elevated. You feel yourself being elevated. You know those feelings like the room is spinning and you hold on to the table. Whee! It's good. <laughs> but long gone. Now it's falling down into this dark pit. And I hollered help. And I came too. North Long Beach, I woke up in Wilmington, California, and third floor of this building. The end of the hall was a apartment. The door opened, TV was blaring, the fights were on. This much I remember. And the most cherished memory in my period of recovery is that initial thing. I passed out right in front of the door and here stood above me a man 82 years old at the time. A professor, retired, doctor, retired and he somewhat knew about alcoholism though he didn't tell me at the time. However, this much I felt. He's one breath on my neck as he was trying to find out whether I was dead or alive, you know. Never forget that. It gives me the chills, you know, goosebumps. Many, many a time I overcame many obstacles with that memory. And he said to me, don't be scared. I'll help you. I'll help you. And for the first time in my life, I became receptive to be helped or willing to be helped. You see, I came from Algiers, Algeria, raised in, well, in May, that's Gemini, isn't it? One face here and one face there. And uh, on one side of the fence, I could very well communicate with a, yeah, man, you know, <coughs> and on the other side of the fence, yes, sir. As a matter of fact, I was debating a while ago, should I untie my tie, you know, loosen it up? <laughs> or should I go ahead with that strict social thing called ethic? You know. And so, 
From Algiers, Algeria, I came to these United States tempered with Islamic tendencies because my family were Muslim, Dutch taboos, alcohol is taboo, very much taboo. I came under the auspices of the revolutionary government. Thank God Alcoholics Anonymous is somewhat anonymous. And I was under an eight-year program, and at the end of this eight-year program, I was supposed to join a diplomatic corps and be assigned to the field. Who knows? Now, being alcoholic and having an addictive personality, I imagined myself being a governor of a state, an ambassador somewhere, but adhering to the principle that no human being likes to think of himself being inferior to another, and I wasn't about to settle for nothing else but the best. Why not dictator of Algeria? Huh? <laughs> I see you agree. You would have felt the <laughs> way I would have felt too, you know. And as I saw my chances, chances slipping away, I had to settle with the thought of being an invisible man. How many powers does an invisible man hold? I could sneak in and out of any country and the whole thing, a land of fantasy. Really weird. Very much so. And so with the help of this retired doctor, Doc Kelly, and here is another one. He's Catholic, I find out. And what was I loaded with prejudice? With his help, I stayed, say, something like a month. It took me about that long, I guess, to recuperate physically. And thank God he didn't give me the Einstein theories, so then I might get rid of the shakes, you know. Instead, he gave me the honeys. And he gave me the cottage cheese and the soups and the sweets and the kindness, the most important thing, the language of the heart, the language of the heart. And I felt it, and believe me, I felt it. Now sober, without alcohol, Without any drugs, I am running on raw nerves. And I came to a meeting lies just like that. I'd married two children. I had married not two children. My wife ran away with another man. And I didn't like the idea of my wife running away with another man. Or my children calling another man daddy. You know what I mean. Pretty hard. And I didn't like the idea of... Uh, these United States compelling me to do things that I didn't really like. And I was really a scared. A traitor to Algeria, a deserter from France, and here I am in America, only a federal income tax, whole sum of money, and a state income tax, and the motor vehicle department, the insurance company, because I got into a wreck, no insurance, and you know what that means. A child support, no job, and that big, my God, why me? And here I came to alcoholics, <laughs> you know. And so, very fortunate was I to buy a book on my very first meeting. With no shame, I like to tell you that I cried, silently cried. Of course, the pride and ego was there very, very much so, you know. But I did cry, and the tears came down. And I remember a little embarrassment, you know, like, and then let go, Richard. You know, I, I couldn't help it. I cried my first meeting on a Friday night. And I put my hand in my pocket at the end of the meeting and came out this $5 bill that I had. And remembering before leaving my apartment, the decision, you know, five bucks, my God, you know, <laughs> another bottle, maybe. Ease the pain. Ease the pain. 
A relief came about when I pulled my five dollars out and gave that secretary uh, the money and got the big book. And ran out to this apartment building, you know, on the third floor, went to Doc Kelly, and I expected that I had a boy tap on his shoulder, you know. You're doing something for yourself. And uh, didn't get it. I was a little disappointed. However, he did tell me to try to read it, that my mind might wander away one word at a time. And he told me about the longest journey starts with the first step. The longest book. The first page. Try it. Aye, aye. All right. There you go. Now, I had this book supposed to solve my problems. Fine. A thought came into my mind, and boy, I was energized and inspired and the whole bit. And I didn't want to tell him about it. I wanted to go to my little room at the other end of the hall. And, you know, the thought was, why go through the whole hassle of reading the whole book? Surely the solution is in the back. <laughs> you know, so we let it go. <laughs> and I did use the back of the book, believe it or not. Now, in the back of the book, the thing that impressed me the most, I think, was the last girl award. It says an award. So being gullible, and <laughs> you know, being kind of selfish, things, something, an award. Maybe I'll get one. <laughs> Talking about medals, you know. <laughs> I'm going to become clean and I'll have something to show for. Show, you know. And, uh, but more than that, really, I think it did say to me that this program did work, is working, and will continue to work. This is what the award simply says. That this program, Alcoholics Anonymous, did work, is working, and will continue to work. And talking about first things first, this cat called Spencer, in the back of the book again, he mentions the things that are so necessary for me at that period of my recovery, the things that were so necessary and yet effective, willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness. And so I went to my little bathroom, looking in the mirror, and I have these three little words, Hey, Richard, are you willing? <laughs> yeah, I think you are. Are you really your funny soul and so on? Yeah. And so here I am, walking the street, going into meetings. I am willing, I'm willing, I'm willing. Yeah, I'm willing, man. I am willing. You've gone crazy, Richard. No. <laughs> I wouldn't change my experience in alcohol, the period of recovery, for anything else. If I had the choice, I would relive it again, believe me. Because, you see, in so doing was the excellence. In so doing was the living. And you know it hasn't stopped. Believe me, it hasn't stopped. Now, my venture into the AA book resembles somewhat Harry. I ran into the sentence that says, um, we feel a man is unthinking when he says sobriety is enough. So you see, I was motivated by the principles, even in being here. I didn't plant the seed in my mother's womb to become an alcoholic. I was meant to be an alcoholic. Now, in working the steps, again, the longest journey starts with the first step to my inner self. I admitted I was an alcoholic without lighting a candle. It's like being reborn with no rituals, believe me. So I've read a lot of goodies and trying to find an easy way out, the softer, easier way, you know. But somehow within me, silently, I answered the question, Are you alcoholic, Richard? Yes, you sure is. You know? And it was beautiful. It was like swallowing something that was nice and good, something that you 
like, you know, beautiful. And again, I had to answer the question that came about in my mind. Richard, if your life had become unmanageable, then who is going to manage it? Who is? Hey, by now I've got the federal income tax people after me, you know. The state, the driver's license, the job, the new employer, the schools, the country of Algeria got its independence and these guys cut your throat for being a traitor, you know. <laughs> Who's going to do it? What's happening here? Who's going to manage my life? And again, I had to revert to old Herbert Spencer's little thing that who, W-H-O, a willingness to be honest with an open mind. And believe me with this, I was led here to where I feel you, people. I feel you. I honest to God feel you. I was told in the big book that just as soon as as I go along the steps, I get into the mind step, the not-so-extravagant promises will be fulfilled among us. Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, but they will always materialize, and I feel you. The peace of mind, the comprehension of serenity, you know, it, and, and the, fear, the fact that fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave you. I'm glad to say to you today that my income tax problem is settled. I've got a driver's license. I can travel to Algeria with a passport and a visa. You know? And the guilt gone. And then the absolute certainty of God's presence within. The fact that God is not only omnipotent, omnipresent, in fact, my children are just as much mine as he, they are his. The realization that they came through me, but not from me. What's more important is the fact that this program is of limitless expansion. And again and again, I'm reminded because I feel good, better than I felt yesterday, that more will be revealed to me. For those of you who are in doubt and hurting, please accept this hurt as growing pains, a bridge to better things. And don't abide by the principle of those who seem to wrest satisfaction out of this world only and become the actor in Alcoholics Anonymous. Be of service. Because in giving and in doing is the being, isn't it? God bless you. I didn't know when I took on the chairmanship of this session that it was going to be of an international complexion. England, Algeria, I don't know where the rest of them are from, but uh, <laughs> that was a splendid speech, Dick, and thank you very, very much. I learned something very interesting in that talk. Uh, I learned that in Southern California they charge $5 for the big book. We only get three here, I think. <laughs> This is wonderful, and never has a chairman been blessed as I have been blessed today. To have two pinch hitters out of three come through like our two pinch hitters plus our regular speaker has. And now, it really gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce the next speaker. I guess it was about a year ago that this conference became a gleam in the eyes of a few people, one in particular. There were many obstacles towards it. There were many obstacles to having it here. But one man in particular, with a hell of a lot of help, but one man in particular refused to accept any obstacles. And he spearheaded this whole thing that brought this splendid convention to the city of St. Louis. And I am happy indeed 
to introduce to you now that man. And I'm going to waive anonymity. Myself, not him. I give you Jim Barber. get to a guy, don't you? My name is Jim Barber. I am an alcoholic. Hi, everybody. I think we should adopt this business of hi to everybody here in St. Louis. I enjoy it very much. I'd like to uh, keep everything in business. I'd like the committee, the planning committee, to meet outside this room immediately following this meeting, and we'll start on the next one. <laughs> There's mine. <clears throat> Where do you begin? Where do you end? I'm not up here to try to top, nor will I equal what you've heard here this afternoon, nor in any part of this conference. It's been a wonderful, wonderful conference as far as I'm concerned. We were talking about the letdown that comes, usually trailing the conference. I haven't experienced that here. I haven't come apart at the seams in this manner here. I have developed an odor since this morning that I didn't have. Uh, when I first entered the hotel three days ago, and they told me that St. Louis out there is still there somewhere. I could go back and tell you the trials and tribulations of what it is to put on something like this, but uh, you can't, it can't be done. It really can't be done. Because in doing this, you would have to enter the minds and the thoughts of everyone who participated in this program. I'd like to take this opportunity, if I may, to introduce a, a person, if she's in the room, I haven't laid my eyes on her yet, but somebody that I neglected last night who has played an important part in the publicity of our conference, a very important part, and after I introduce her, I'll explain why. Lee Tretbar, would you stand up if you're in the room? Well, she had to go home. To those of you who are here in St. Louis, I would certainly appreciate if you would gather up Lee's address or her phone number from somebody and send her a card. She did a tremendous job of publicity. And from this publicity, we have a new member here with us today, a brand new baby. If it wouldn't be any embarrassment to him, I'd like to invite him to stand up. If it is an embarrassment, let's forget it. <laughs> to me, this has made the conference. At least the message has been brought to one person. Publicity plays an important part, although it be with attraction. I'm sorry if I have broken a tradition or if we have broken a tradition, as I understand we may have. I was promised that we would be completely blacked out on television. I understand it was recognizable. If this has happened, I'm deeply sorry. And as conferences go, I won't say that I've been too busy because I haven't been too busy. But if I have neglected you in meeting or greeting you, or if I've offended you in any way, for this I'm sorry. I hope to meet each and every one here on a different ground, maybe at the next conference, that I can stop and take time. And so many of our people on the committees have been flittering about and getting things done. They have given you the package. The only thing that I have done is put the ribbon on it, maybe. And sometimes the chairman seems to get all the glory. And this is not true at all. 
I have received, strictly received. If I could put what I have given, it would probably fit in that picture. I have received much more than I'll ever give to this program. I'm always reminded when addressing a group of alcoholics of a date, I don't think that I've ever stood before a group of alcoholics to talk before that I haven't been reminded of December the 18th of 1956. For at this particular date, I made some new acquaintances. One of them I'd like to introduce to you now, one who has been patient, kind, and understanding with me, my wife Ruth. Stand up, Ruth. I know I'll get hell when I get home from that. <laughs> now, when I say I've made an acquaintance on this date with her after being married ten and a half years at this time, because on this particular date a new life started for Jim, a real new life. After 17 years of trying to dig my way into hell, I started filling up the hole. Another acquaintance I had met was a little-known organization called Alcoholics Anonymous. And because it was little-known is because we are anonymous. For this, I'm indebted at, to no end. And the third acquaintance that I met was God, the God that brought me to Alcoholics Anonymous. The God that left me with enough buttons to do something about my drinking problem. He has given me, as he has given you, every conceivable chance to use this life that we have for preparation for the life beyond, if there be one, every conceivable chance of getting there and attaining what we're after. I'm indebted for a hardcore AA who was my sponsor, who is my sponsor. I'm indebted to the chance that he gave me to be something, to be myself and try to act like it, to see that I was kept busy when I needed to be busy, to see that responsibilities came early, such as the treasury of a group, the secretary of a group, and many privileges on down the line. The summit is this. I've just fulfilled two years of not obligation because it hasn't been an obligation to serving as the Eastern Conference of Missouri Delegate to New York. As I mentioned, this is the summit to being the chairman of such a fine conference as this. I remember a man telling me one time there's no end and that it will continue to get better. And at this particular time, I didn't think anything could get better when he told me this. And here was a man standing with 15 years uninterrupted sobriety. He said, every day it gets better. Each day that you awake is better than yesterday. This is the today. So with these three new acquaintances a little over nine and a half years ago became many, many acquaintances that I have met since. Names maybe I can't remember. Faces I usually do remember. But friends, the percentages are so great I don't really realize that there are any earth people as friends, and earth people to me are outside of AA. From these various things that has been given to me as a privilege, I'm asking this conference for your permission, for a leave of absence, not from AA, but merely to reacquaint myself with these three acquaintances. 
I feel the time has come when I must re-educate myself. Richard has given me something to think about. Maybe I've been too busy being busy. I like to think that I can now reread the big book instead of starting from the back, as Richard mentioned. I'd like to go back to the front. I want to take another look, because if it is to get better, I'm sure that I'll find it in there. I'm sure that I can find any answer in the big book. I'm sure that you agree with this. So with your permission, I would like to take this leave of absence from any outside activities outside of my own home group, whom we just started not too long ago, and we're doing very well. I hope to continue to see it grow, and somebody will get tired of it and start another one and another one and another one until we can fill up the United States and straighten out this whole damn country if we have to. <laughs> I'd like to thank those who have preceded us, the people who came into AA and made it work, the people who, as Dr. Bob said, didn't louse it up. They kept it simple. And for this, I'm indebted up to my head because had you loused it up, had you complicated it, Jim Barber could have never made the grade. If you'd have made it any more complicated than one and one is two, I could have never made it. You kept it that way, and for this, I'm, I'm very grateful. I hope that our paths may cross again. I'm sure they will with some of us. For some of us, it may never happen. Your memories, my memories of you, will live with me from now on. This is all that I can carry with me constantly. The things that I've heard here the last last couple of days, and it's just been fleeting moments that I've been able to hop into a meeting, uh, catch something that I could chew on for a little bit and hop out again, and uh, uh, I've gathered up an awful lot of information. I'll be certainly excited of hearing the tapes that have been made of this session so that I can sit maybe in the privacy of my own home and listen. I hope that it's been a pleasant experience for you. As the little thing says here in the book, uh, I don't know where Al got the title for it, but he says this is it. This is what it was all about, this very thing here. But I'm not let down this time. I'm completely satisfied because of the one person who is here with us, with us today, because of all of you who took the time and trouble to make this possible. You see, because we who are on these various little committees to throw these things together it's no good, is it, until you get here. It's no good until you come and share your experiences with us. You have made the success, complete success, of this conference. I hope to see you all again maybe next year. If it's not next year, at any other time, I hope you all have a safe journey home. And may God be with you every step of the way. I thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.